Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi and welcome everyone. This presentation is going to be a complementary presentation to that of your colleagues on the same topic. For this presentation, I would like to give credit to Picker, Clark, Dunn, Collins, Livner, Lofus, and Van der Taas for their publication on Applying IVRS Standards, 4th edition 2016, as well as KPMG for their handbook on share based payments, IFRS 2 2018. For this presentation, I will only touch briefly on the details of SPP and I will include some questions that are asked about SPP, some things that you need to know about SPP as per MFRS2, definitions of important terms and recognitions and measurements of SPP transactions. However, the highlights of this presentation will be on the Type 3 SPP transaction, which is classified as others, and also illustrations of SPP transactions under all three types of SPP transaction as per MFRS2. Let us start with some questions that are being asked about SPP. The first question is on why companies prefer to offer SPP remunerations or agreements rather than simple cash payments, especially between a company and its employees. Specific to employees, based on principal agent theory or agency theory, we know that the interests of managers, for example, are oftentimes not the same with the interests of the company. They might focus on their own benefits as opposed to benefits of the company as a whole. For example, we may have managers that apply income smoothing because they want to maintain a certain level of bonus, that is if bonus is attached to the level of annual sales, for example. So to avoid this, perhaps the company could offer SBP with performance condition, stating that the company needs to achieve a certain level of sales before they can exercise the SBP awards. Second scenario is where a company would want to reward past services. Therefore, they look at their service condition or performance condition before rewarding them with cash based on the value of equity or rewarding them with equity, which employees in a way have helped to achieve the value of um, the shares. And third reason, perhaps liquidity is an issue and company would want to provide rewards in equity instead of cash. The second question is on what is SBP exactly? Well, basically the standard does not provide any definitions of the term share-based payment, but it does give definitions of SBP transaction and SBP agreement. And from there, we could identify SBP as payment made to the other parties based on shares and based on agreement, either settlement made by cash or by equity. The third question is about SBP arrangement in group. For this, it will be quite complex, thus KPMG advises to simply ignore, but we can always still consider them separately and not as a group. To summarize what we need to know about SBP, I put them into three parts. First, the standard requires us to measure and recognize SBP awards in our financial statements. Second, there are three types of SBP transactions, cash settled, equity settled and others, where we were given a choice either to settle in cash or in equity. Your colleagues have discussed the two types, the first two types, so I'm going to just briefly go through them, but we'll focus more on the third type. And finally, under MFRS2, the standard gives us guideline on how to measure and recognize SBP as well as details out the requirements for SBP transactions and awards. For SBP transactions, we have two major groups, an entity either acquire goods or services from external parties or an entity awards or give remunerations for services given by its employees. Briefly, as you may already know, equity settled SBP transactions result in an entity receiving goods or services in exchange for its shares and cash settled SVP transactions result in an entity receiving goods or services by incurring an obligation to pay in cash plus a liability based on the value of its shares. For the third category of SVP transactions, it results in receiving goods or services with a choice of either settlement. These are other terms that you need to know in order to understand SPP transactions on the MFRS2, all of which have been explained by your colleagues. I just want to highlight a few things. For grant date, this is the date at which the entity and its counterparties agreed to a share-based payment agreement, of which both parties must understand the terms and conditions attached to the arrangements or to the SVP scheme.
This is also the date where the entity confers or grants its counterparties the right to cash, other assets or equity instruments of the entity, provided the specified vesting conditions are met. Or, if the arrangement or the scheme is subject to an approval process, grant date is the date when that approval is obtained instead of when the agreement was presented to the counterparty. And then, please note that the difference between service condition and performance condition is that service condition does not require performance target to be met. However, for performance condition, it does require service condition to be met. Also, because performance condition has both service period and performance target, the period to achieve the performance target shall not extend beyond the end of the service period. Meaning to say, by end of the service period, target must be achieved for the SVP scheme to be vested. And it may start before the service period. However, the starting date for the performance target shall not be substantially before the commencement of the service period, meaning to say it cannot be too far before the service condition started. And for performance target that is based on market condition, um, and the market condition is not met, we still need to recognize the goods and services received. Therefore, when the market condition does not vest, we need to consider other condition. And at the very least, the service condition. That is the best period in which employees, for example, remain in the company and provide services to the company. In terms of recognizing the scheme, we must start recognizing the goods or services received or acquired in a share-based payment transaction when we obtain the goods or as the services are received. And this can be at one point in time, thus immediate recognition in full or over a period, partially each time until settlement. Consequently, we also recognize the corresponding increase in equity if the goods or services were received in an equity settled SVP transaction, or a liability if the goods or services were acquired in a cash settled SVP transaction. And then, depending on the type of goods or services received, if goods or services received or acquired do not qualify for recognition as assets, that is, as SBP costs, they shall be recognized as expenses or SBP expense. So we are going to use these terms in our book of records. Having said that, we will have for equity settle SBP transaction a debit of SBP costs or expense and a credit of equity. As for the value, we shall recognize the fair value of goods and services received or where relevant the fair value of equity instruments. As for the cash settled SVP transaction, we will have a debit of SVP costs or expense and a credit of liability before settlement in cash, where the value shall be fair value of the liability incurred that must be remeasured at the end of every period as well as at settlement. If there is any changes to the value, we shall recognize the change in profit and loss, basically as SPP expense as well. Specific to equity settled SPP transactions, if the scheme vested immediately, for example, if an entity is rewarding its employees for their past performance, therefore their performance have already been achieved at grant date, we shall debit SBP cost or expense and credit equity with the full amounts of value of the award. If the scheme vested over a period, for example, awarding employees for their performance or services in the future, therefore, over the vesting period, we shall debit SBP cost or expense and credit equity with the value that are distributed throughout the period. The full amounts will be achieved only at the end of the vesting period. As for the value that we need to record, we shall refer to the fair value of the equity instruments granted based on market price at measurement date. And if the equity instruments has no market price, we are required to use a valuation technique. So we need to estimate using certain formula that are generally accepted. And if we still cannot estimate the fair value reliably, which is very rare, we can use the intrinsic value of the equity instruments based on the number of equity instruments that are vested or eventually exercised. Other provisions that I would like to highlight are the following. First, if vesting condition other than market condition not met,
an entity shall not recognize any amount of goods and services received, therefore the equity is not vested. Second, market condition is considered when estimating the fair value of equity instrument. Therefore, if market condition not met but other non-market vesting conditions were satisfied, we still recognize goods and services received, therefore equity is vested. This means if employees did not meet market condition but satisfied service condition, we still recognize services received, therefore the scheme is considered vested. Third, there shall be no adjustment to amount in equity after vesting date. If vested equity forfeited or not exercised, there shall be no reversal of amount in equity. It stays there. However, we may transfer between equity. And the last one, if an equity repurchase the vested equity, it will be treated as a deduction in equity, just like a repurchase of all new shares that were issued not through SVP scheme. Let us now look at a few illustrations of equity settled SVP transactions. For the first illustration, we have Wang Limited who granted 100 share option to its employees, 50 of them, with a 2 years service condition and it granted the fair value of the equity instrument was estimated at $25. For this SVP scheme, we shall recognize the fair value of the instruments for the 50 employees over the two year period. As mentioned earlier, for this case, we need to vest over the two year vesting period and the estimated full amount will be at $125,000 given by 100 options each for 50 employees at the fair value of $25. We shall have the following distributions of the full amount. For year 1, the SBP expense will be at $62,500 given by 100 options for 50 employees at the fair value of $25 for half of the vesting period. And for year 2, the SBP expense will also be the same. <clears throat> The cumulative expense will be $62,500 at the end of the first year and $125,000 at the end of the second year. These values will be recorded by debiting SVP expense and crediting equity at the end of every year. In the second illustration, we have similar scheme granted to 50 employees. Only thing, this time there is expectation that some employees will leave the company during the three year vesting period. Given here at the end of year one, three employees left and 16% or eight employees is expected to leave within the three year vesting period, meaning we will expect another five employees to leave in the coming two years. In year two, two employees left, so we already have five employees left the company. And at this time, it was estimated that a total of six employees or 12% of employees will be leaving the company within the three year vesting period meaning we expect another one person to leave in year three. Come year three, their prediction was correct. Only one more employee left. Therefore, we need to reward only 44 that remains in the company. Again, for this scheme, the amounts will be distributed over the three year vesting period. And the expected vested share option at grant date was 100 option for 50 employees, that is 5,000 units of share option. So for year one, we expect, to reward, <clears throat> we expect to reward option to 42 employees or 84% of the total at $25 for one third of the vesting period. In year two, we expect to reward option to 44 employees or 88% of the total at $25 for two thirds of the vesting period. But we already recognize $35,000 worth of expense, so we need to deduct that from the total amount, giving us only $38,333. Then in year 3, it is confirmed that the company will reward 44 of the employees with 100 options each. Therefore, 4,400 units of options at fair value of $25 each and deduct with what we already recognized in year 1 and year 2, leaving us a sum of $36,667 worth of expense and a total of $110,000 worth of equity. In this third illustration, Instead of share option, the company granted shares to 50 of its employees with a fair value of $20 at grant date with performance condition attached. They must remain in the company for the next three years, thus three year vesting period. 
And for performance target, if the company's earnings increase by more than 18% in the first year, the scheme will vest at the end of year one. If less, then it will be extended to year two. If in year two, earnings increase by more than 13% average across year one and year two, then the scheme will vest at the end of year two. Otherwise, it will be extended to year three. And in year three, if earnings increase by more than 10% average across the three-year period, the scheme will vest. Otherwise, the scheme is not vested and no shares will be issued to the 50 employees. Now, say in year one, earnings increase only by 14%. So we know that the scheme will not vest this year. On top of that, three employees left the company, leaving only 47 employees. For the subsequent year, the company expected that the earnings will continue to increase by 14%, therefore the scheme will vest at end of year 2, since the average earnings is more than 13% as per performance target in year 2. It is also estimated that 3 more employees will be leaving the company in year 2, therefore the company need to pay for only 44 employees at the end of year 2. This gives us the following. At the end of year 1, we shall record an expense for 100 shares issued to each of the 44 employees at fair value of $20 for half of the vesting period, giving us a $44,000 worth of SBP expense. What happened in year 2? Earnings increased by only 10%, therefore the average earnings for the 2 years was less than targeted. So the scheme was not vested. On top of that, 2 employees left in year 2. The company then expected that in year 3, earnings will increase at least by 6%, giving an average earnings of more than 10%, thus fulfilling the requirements and the scheme will vest in year 3. Also, it is expected that 2 more employees will leave the company, leaving only 43 employees remaining in the company. Given this information in year 2, we record SVP expense for 100 shares issued for 43 employees at $20 fair value, for two-thirds of the vesting period, minus what have already been recognized earlier, giving us $13,333 worth of SVP expense for the year. In year 3, earnings increased by 8%, which is greater than expected, thus meeting the performance target, and the scheme was vested. However, another three employees left the company. For this, we record Payment for 100 shares issued for 42 employees at $20 fair value minus the amount already recognized in previous years, giving SVP expense for the year of 26667 In total, we have SVP expense of $84,000, which is equivalent to payment for 100 shares issued to 42 employees remaining at the end of the vesting period at $20 fair value. Let us try this fourth illustration. Here we have 5,000 share options with exercise price of $40 were granted to a senior executive with service condition attached. First, he must remain in the company for the next three years. Second, if earnings increase by an average of 10% a year for the three-year vesting period, the exercise price will be reduced to $30, so the executive will need to pay less. So this is just another way of encouraging the executive to work towards ensuring an average earnings increase of 10% a year. This is not, however, a performance target. On grant date, the fair value of the option with exercise price of $40 and $30 were at $12 and $16 respectively. Now remember that the entity will need to record its expense at fair value of the equity instruments while the exercise price is the price that the executive will need to pay if he decided to exercise option granted to him. In year 1, the earnings increased by 12%, which is a good start, and it is expected that it will continue at this rate for the next 2 years. Therefore, at the end of the first year, we record SVP expense for 5,000 units of options as its fair value for option with exercise price of $30, which is $16 for the one-third of the three-year vesting period. In year two, the earnings increased by 13%, so the company was confident that the average earnings of 10% will be met at the end of the vesting period. Therefore, for the second year, we record SVP expense for 5,000 units of options at the same uh, fair value of 
for two thirds of the vesting period minus whatever expense that have been recorded in year one. In year three, unfortunately, earnings only increased by 3%, therefore the 10% average increase in earnings not achieved. This will revert the exercise price back to $40 per option, thus the fair value reduced to $12. Therefore, in the third year, we record SBP expense for 5,000 units of option at fair value of $12 minus whatever expense amount that has been recorded previously. So the total SBP expense is at $60,000, which is equivalent to the 5,000 option at $12 each. Let's move on to our last illustration for equity settled SBP transaction. Here we have 5,000 share option granted to senior executive with performance condition attached where performance target was based on market condition. First, he must remain in the company for three years. Second, the share price must increase to above $25 at the end of the three year vesting period for him to exercise the option. So this is the performance target that is attached to market condition instead of conditions of the company. On top of that, as an added incentive, if he managed to achieve the performance target, he can exercise the option at any time within seven years after the vesting period. With this, the senior executive would be able to exercise when he thinks he will benefit the most within a quite significant length of time, which is seven years. For the fair value, it is estimated that for the share price to increase to $25 at the end of year three, the fair value will be at $9. And finally, as stated here, the senior executive completed a three-year service condition. For the recording of SVP expense, regardless of the share price at the end of year three, we still need to recognize the expense throughout the vesting period. Therefore, for year one, we record SVP expense for 5,000 options at $9 fair value for one third of the vesting period. For year two, we record SVP expense for 5,000 options at $9 fair value for two-thirds of the vesting period minus what has been recognized previously. And at the end of year three, we record SVP expense for 5,000 options at $9 fair value for the three-year vesting period minus what has been recognized previously. In total, we'll, we'll have SVP expense and total equity recorded at $45,000 being the amounts for 5,000 units of options at $9 fair value. The next thing to do is to see if the share price actually has increased uh, to above $25. If yes, the executive will be able to exercise the options within seven years period. If no, the option still vested since he did not satisfy a market condition, but he satisfied the service condition. It's just that he will not have the uh, seven year period to exercise the option. Let us now move on to modifications of equity settled SPP transaction. Modification covers any modification in the terms and condition for granting the equity, and it may include changes in exercise price for share option or changing the number of equity granted, of which this modification may change the fair value of the equity. Should the modification result in incremental change in fair value and the modification happen during the vesting period, we shall recognize the change from modification date onwards. If the modification happened after vesting period, the incremental change shall be recognized immediately. Or if it involves extending the vesting period, the, ex the incremental change shall be recognized over the additional vesting period. If however the modification results in a decrease in fair value, we simply ignore the change and treat it as if no modification has taken place. For the modification that increased the fair value of equity instruments, this is referred to as beneficial modification. For the modification that reduced the fair value of equity instrument, this is referred to as non-beneficial modification because the effect will be ignored anyway. Another thing to note is that if the company apply intrinsic value since fair value is not reliably measured, meaning applying paragraph 24, it may not need to apply this provision for modification, simply because when estimating for intrinsic value, any modifications have already taken uh, into consideration. Now let us look at one example for modification. What we have here is a company granting 100 share option to 50 of its employees, where the fair value of the options was estimated to be $15 at grant date and attached to it a service condition of three years. Throughout the three-year period, it was estimated that three employees will leave the company. 
What happened in year one, four employees left and the company estimated another seven employees to leave throughout the remaining two years. Also, there was a drop in share price at the end of year one. Therefore, to keep employees motivated, the company repriced the option. At the repricing date, the original fair value of the option was at $5 and after repricing, the fair value changed to $8, giving an increase of $3. This incremental value will then be recognized over the remaining two years. In year two, four employees left and four more are estimated to leave. And in year three, three employees left, thus there was 39 employees remain. The share option will be vested for these 39 employees at the end of year three. For year one, given this scenario, we recognize SVP expense on 100 share option for 39 employees at the fair value of $15 for one third of the vesting period. The effect of the modification will only be recognized over the remaining two years, therefore will not be captured by the SVP expense in year one. In year two, we recognize SVP expense on 100 options for 38 employees at the fair value of $15 for the two thirds of the vesting period plus the incremental value of $3 over two years vesting period, minus whatever we have recognized earlier in year one. And in year three, we recognize SBP expense on 100 option for 39 employees at fair value of $18, $15 being the original fair value and $3 being the incremental value, minus what we have recognized previously in year one and year two. So we end up with SVP expense for year three of $26,500, while the accumulated expense is at $70,200. This $70,200 is equivalent to the expense on 100 option for 39 employees at fair value of $18. Let us now look briefly at cash settle SVP transaction. Examples of such transactions include the share appreciation rights, where it gives rights to the employees to future cash based on the increase in the share price. Another example would be granting redeemable shares, because for redeemable shares, we know for sure that the shares will eventually be converted into cash. To recognize redebit SVP costs or expense and credit liability, since now we have the obligation to pay cash, at the full amount of the liability if we immediately settle the scheme at grant date, like rewarding employees for previous services done, and at an allocated amount over a vesting period for services to be provided during vesting period. Here we have an example of cash settle SVP transaction, where we have 100 SAS granted to 50 employees with a service condition of 3 years. The company estimated the fair value of SAS for the three years and the intrinsic value at year three, four, and five, where it will be used for cash paid out for those years. Given also are the number of employees that leave the company in year one until year four, with estimated number of employees to leave the company in year one to year three of the vesting period and the exercise of SARS in year three and year five. Please note the information for year four and year five are to be used when recognizing the payment. In year one, we recognize SVP expense on 100 stars for 41 employees at the fair value of $14.40 for one third of the vesting period. So we recognize SVP expense and liability of $19,680. In year two, we recognize SVP expense for 100 SARS for 40 employees at fair value of $15.15 for the two thirds of the vesting period minus whatever we have recognized in previous year. So we recognize SVP expense and liability of $21,653. In year three, we recognize SVP expense on SARS for 26 employees that have not exercised their SARS at $18.20 fair value minus what we have recognized in year one and year two. So this will remain as liability. While payment is directly made for 15 employees at its intrinsic value of $15. So we have SVP expense of $28,487.
where 5,987 is still not paid as the liability and 22,500 has been paid, so we credit cash. In year 4, we recognize the payment made on 100 stars for 14 employees at its intrinsic value of $20 as well as remeasured the remaining unpaid 100 stars for 12 employees not yet exercised their SARS at fair value of $21.40. In this case, the fair value of the remaining liability is at $25,680. However, we need to minus with what we have recognized in previous years of $47,320, which results in a decrease in liability of $21,640. We then record the reduction in liability of $21,640 which will result in remaining liability at 25680 And we record new SBP expense at 28000 being the cash paid to employees that exercise their SAS. Finally, in year 5, there is no more unexercised SAS remaining, therefore we need to eliminate the balance of the liability and record the payments of cash of 30000 for the remaining 12 employees for their 100 SARS at $25 intrinsic value. Let us now look at the third category of SBP transactions, where we have a choice of either equity or cash at settlement. For SBP transactions with cash alternative, terms of the arrangement provides the choice to settle the transaction in cash or other assets, or by issuing equity instruments. However, the focus will be at liability. If the entity has an obligation to pay cash or other assets, it will be treated like cash settle as pay transactions. If the entity has no obligation to pay cash or other assets, it will be treated like equity settled SPP transactions. The other thing that we need to also consider is if the choice of settlement, whether it is at the hands of the entity or its counterparty, if the rights to choose is at the hands of the counterparty, it will be treated like a compound financial instrument where it has both debt component and equity component, simply because we wouldn't know what the counterparty will choose, thus 50% chance it will be settled in cash and 50% chance it will be settled in equity. In terms of measurement for counterparty other than employees, the equity component will be determined as the difference between the fair value of goods or services received and the debt component at the date when goods and services received. For other SVP transactions, including those with employees, we shall measure the fair value of the compound financial instruments at the measurement date. And we do that by first measuring the debt component and then only the fair value of equity component. At the date of settlement, we need to remeasure the liability to its fair value. If counterparty choose equity settlement, thus the entity need to issue equity, the liability shall be transferred direct to equity as the considerations for the equity instruments issued. If counterparty choose cash settlement, the payment shall be applied to settle the liability in full. Any equity component previously recognized shall remain within equity and it can also be transferred to another component of equity so long as it remains in equity. Now if the rights to choose is at the hands of the entity, it has to determine whether at present it has the obligation to settle in cash. If the answer is yes, then it will be treated as cash settled SBP transaction. This can happen if the equity component has no commercial substance. For example, the entity is not allowed to issue shares for SBP transaction, thus there is no way that it will issue equity, therefore there is no option, it has to be uh, settled in cash. Or if by experience, the entity always choose to settle in cash, or it is the policy of the entity, whenever cash alternative is presented, it will choose cash settlement. If the entity determines that it has no obligation to settle in cash, then the SPP transaction will be treated as equity settled. Where at settlement, if it chooses to settle in cash, it will be treated as deduction from the equity, 
reflecting a repurchase. And if it choose to settle in equity, no further recordings is required. If, however, it choose to settle at a higher fair value, whether cash or equity, it needs to recognize additional expense, which is the difference between the cash paid and the fair value of the equity instruments that would otherwise have been issued, or the difference between the fair value of the equity instruments issued and the amounts of cash that would otherwise have been paid, whichever is applicable. Let us look at one illustration where the rights is at the hands of the counterparty, and for this illustration, the cash option given at grant date. We have here a company that granted its CEO with alternatives share-based payments with service conditions of two years. The alternatives are, he can choose to receive cash at the intrinsic value of 1,000 units of SaaS at settlement, or he can have 1,200 shares option that he can exercise at the exercise price that is equal to share price at grant date. The term of the scheme also stated that he can exercise his rights to either settlement on the 29th of January after the two-year investing period. Also given is the fair value of both individual SAS and individual option at grant date at every end of the two years and at settlement date. For these alternatives, we treat it as a compound financial instrument and the way we measure the fair value is that we start with the debt component and then only the equity component. Having said that, at grant date, we have fair value of debt component at 1,000 ringgit being 1,000 units of SAS at its 1 ringgit fair value and the equity component of 1,200 ringgit being 1,200 units of share option at its fair value of 1 ringgit Therefore, the equity component will be recorded as the excess amount of 200 ringgit. At the end of the first year, we recognize the equity component of 200 ringgit for one half of the vesting period. Therefore, we end up with 100 ringgit and debt components of fair value of 1 ringgit entity cent for 1000 SARS for half of the vesting period. Thus, we have 650 ringgit. At the end of the second year, we recognize equity component at, again, 100 ringgit being half of the total fair value, and debt component at 750 ringgit being 1,000 units of SARS at the fair value as at that date of 1 ringgit and 40 cent, minus the amount recognized in previous year. Therefore, at the end of the second year, we will have accumulated equity of 200 ringgit and accumulated liability of 1,400 ringgit. At settlement date, we need to re-measure the debt component. Therefore, we have fair value of debt component at 1,350 for 1,000 units of SAS at fair value of 1 ringgit and 35 cent. This means that we need to reduce the previous fair value amount by 50 ringgit. Thus, the remaining liability will be equivalent to its fair value as at that date. The general entries will be as shown here, based on the values that we have calculated just now. At settlement date, we recognize the remeasurements of fair value of debt component, which results in reductions of 50 ringgit. And then if the counterparty eventually choose to settle in cash, we simply make payment in cash and eliminate the liability. And no amendment needed in the previously recognized equity component. The cumulative expense will be 1,550 ringgit at settlement date, if the counterparty eventually choose to settle in equity, we simply transfer the liability directly to equity. Regardless, the cumulative expense will still be the same at 1,550 ringgit. Let us look at another illustration. This time, the cash option is added not at grant date, but during the vesting period. We have here a company granting 10,000 units of shares at fair value of $24 with a service conditions of 3 years. At the end of year 2, share price dropped to $15. Therefore, to make the scheme remain attractive to the senior manager, the company added cash alternative to the SBP scheme. He is to receive cash equivalent to the fair value of shares on vesting date. It is also given that on vesting date, the price has dropped further to $12. For the first year, at the end of the year, 
we recognize SBP expense for 10,000 shares at its fair value of $24 for the one third of the vesting period. We then recognize the expense with the corresponding equity. At the end of year two, we recognize 10,000 shares at its fair value of $24 for the two third of the vesting period and cash alternative equivalent to 10,000 shares at its fair value of $15 at the date for two-thirds of the vesting period. So we recognize SVP expense and equity at $80,000 and eliminate the equity by the amount of newly recognized liability of $100,000. By this, the balance in equity component will be at $60,000 and the balance of debt components will be at $100,000. Please remember that once we have cash alternative, we will give priority to debt components while equity component will bear the excess fair value. In year 3, we will recognize SBP expense of $80,000 being 10,000 shares at $24 fair value minus previously recognized cumulative amounts from debt and equity components and recognize a debt component of 10,000 shares at fair value of $12 minus the total fair value of debt when cash alternative was added at $150,000. Please note that when the debt component was added, the potential amount of total debt was at $150,000, being 10,000 shares at its fair value of $15. And at settlement date, it needs to be at its fair value of $12, giving a total debt component of $120,000. So that is a reduction of 30,000 from the potential debt amount at modification date. So we recognize SBP expense of 80,000 with corresponding equity of 30,000 and liability of 50,000 and eliminate 30,000 from its liability to get to the fair value of $120,000. At the end of year 3, we have recognized 210,000 worth of SBP expense, 90,000 worth of equity and 120,000 worth of debt. At settlement date, the counterparty has a choice of settlement in cash or equity. If it chooses to settle in cash, payment will be made in cash and the total amounts of its liability will be eliminated. Whatever amounts that was recognized as equity will remain in equity with an option to move it to another equity account if you wish to do so. If it chooses to settle in equity, all of the debt components will be directly transferred to equity. This will be the last illustration for this presentation. We have SBP transaction with cash alternative and the rights is in the hands of the entity. And for this illustration, it is determined that the entity has no obligation to settle in cash. Here we have this company granted its CEO with alternative SBP scheme with one year service condition. The scheme gives the rights to the company to choose between cash settlement or equity settlement. Given are the fair values of the cash alternative at 1,000 ringgit at grant date and the fair value of equity alternative at 1,200 ringgit. We are also given two scenarios with different value of equity alternative and cash alternative. We can see that for scenario one, the fair value of cash alternative is higher than the equity alternative while in scenario 2, the fair value of equity alternative is higher than the cash alternative. Given that the entity has no obligation to settle in cash, we will treat the SBP transaction as equity settle. Therefore, at grant date, we have to recognize SBP expense and the corresponding equity at 1,200 ringgit being the fair value of equity at grant date. And this is true for both scenarios. At settlement date for scenario 1, say that the entity chose to settle in equity, which fair value is lower than the cash alternative, no additional entries needed as equity settle will depend on the fair value at grant date. If the entity chose to settle in cash instead, which fair value is higher than the equity alternative, we need to recognize the difference in the fair value of both alternatives at settlement date, which is 100 ringgit. Therefore, we recognize the difference in profit and loss as additional SPP expense, debit equity with 1,400 ringgit fair value for equity alternative, and this will be considered as a repurchase of shares and credit cash 
with the actual amounts of debt settlements of 1,500 ringgit. For scenario number two, at settlement date, where the fair value of equity alternative is higher than the fair value of cash alternative, if the entity choose to settle in equity, it will need to recognize the difference of 50 ringgit as additional SBP expense and thus equity. If the entity choose to settle in cash, which is lower than equity alternatives, i.e. the fair value, we shall debit equity and make cash payments of 1,500 ringgit the full amount for cash alternative. Please note again that the value of equity debited is higher than what recorded earlier, but that does not matter because we treat it as repurchase of shares. So that concludes this presentation. Now, please bear in mind that these, all of these are not exhaustive examples of SBP transactions. We could have many more with different investing conditions and modifications and choices. Plus, we did not touch on reloading, where I think that is for you to explore when you work in the field. But at least we have covered all types of SBP transactions. So I hope this presentation has helped you to understand the topic a bit better. If you think you miss anything, you can always re-watch the video or use this timestamp to go to the specific part that you need. So that is all from me. Thank you very much for your attention and until next time, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.